Meno. Um, I will tell you a little bit of the Internet of Things today, um, which we're doing with our company, Boiland. And uh, just to give you a brief overview of what we're doing, uh, indeed, what Martijn said, we're doing lots of websites, animations, flash interfaces, uh, also corporate identities, lots of print stuff. And just lately, in 2008, we saw a new opportunity in what we all call the Internet of Things. Um, so let's have a look. First of all, it's a phenomenon with a lot of names. People just tell me, okay, is it the Internet of Things? Maybe is it the Web of Things? Uh, is it the physical web? Uh, even the tactile web? All these terms you hear around. And it's just actually basically one, one phenomenon which I will try to explain to you today. And um, now I think my thing is broken. Huh? Because I see it right here. Ah. That's it. Okay, so what's it really? <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, I will stay more or less in this side. So I'd like to start, start with the cloud. So I especially don't refer to the internet because the internet is more like a, a connected web of computers, of personal computers. And now I want to talk about the cloud, just the whole pile of data we've been, uh, we've been starting up like uh, the, the last 10 years. And it's all about the touch points of the cloud because we have to interact with this whole pile of data we've been creating. And um, like 10 years ago, most touch points were desktop computers. But as we saw, um, the web started to shift, started to become mobile and laptops uh, were being used. And now also smartphones. So the web is now the ultimate mobile platform because all smartphones are being attached to the cloud and you can interact with it. And these are just the physical touch points. But you can also think of virtual touch points. Actually, uh, a thing like um, a website is also a kind of touch point, but it's a virtual touch point. But it's, it's a way for users to interact, to grab, to communicate with the web. And um, uh, also, APIs. For, for programmers, you can easily use APIs to interact with the cloud, to, to make your own code, build upon code that's already inside the cloud. Um, and also apps, because the mobile platform, all the, all the smartphones have come there. We also now have apps. And now the last one, actually physical products, consumer products, but also industrial products are being added uh, to the cloud. And that's actually just one more extra touch point. And all these pro products were already here. Uh, but in fact, now they're being connected. So, we like to think of it as a meta product. And we call it meta because it's beyond normal consumer products. There's an added internet layer. And so there you have a physical part and a web part. And the physical part usually uses sensors or actuators or a mixture of sensors and actuators. And also, um, in case it needs to interact with a user, it also can have an interface, but it doesn't necessarily need to. And the web uses, uh, is to be used as a, as a way to exchange data with this tactile part. So why now? Why does this trend evolve right now? Well, we saw a lot of trends um, concerning this whole big Internet of Things trend. Uh, we see data is abundant. It's instantly available. So what I call the cloud is this whole data accessibility. It's now always an instant because Every location has Wi-Fi. You can just grab the data. The second one is tons of communication technologies. We see like QR codes, RFID, uh, augmented reality, e-ink even being used from the web to physical uh, touch points, and GPS, pinpoint locations. It's all technologies that can be used and communicate with the web. And last one is storage and bandwidth drive, uh, prices have dropped. So what we see is like every year prices like half almost and they're like almost like turning to zero. You can almost neglect it unless you're Facebook, uh, of course. But um, So let me tell you a little bit about uh, uh, the meta architecture. We see five classes. We have like um, uh, uh, the class one is where the information flow goes from the product, which consists of sensors, towards a, a certain web interface uh, with which the, commu uh, the user communicates. But we also see like, that the information can be turned around. Like you interact with a web interface and, you've put, and you put um, information towards a product, then it is 
actually an actuator. The Olinda radio, for example, I don't know if you know it, from Burke, London, can be seen as an actuator because you put your online social account and the web radio is being connected to the web and it plays the sound of what your friends are listening to. The third class is actually mostly being used, I think, with uh, augmented reality because it's twofold way of, of uh, the information flow. So the web uh, puts information towards the product, it uh, actuates, and the sensors of the product put information towards the web. And then the fourth product is actually uh, a kind of way where the web doesn't necessarily have an interface, so users don't act with the web itself, but the web is merely used as a transportation system to let two products communicate with each other. And the best, like a good example, two products communicating with each other. And the fifth class, it's actually a kind of manual connection and that you have, like in case with RFID or with QR codes, and you can scan a kind of tag and so you get a hyperlink towards the web. So it's kind of a manual thing. So now the meta fields, we've seen a kind of structure and I must say there are like really a million ways to, to do a categorization because it's such a new field, so many products popping up, just, just one way to do it. First one we see is uh, sensing wearables. So Nike Plus, of course, one of the first uh, examples, but also just now uh, the Fitbit has started and things like uh, S2H, Switch to Health, you can look it up. Uh, all wearable kind of things that, that just are s basically sensors and then meter stuff around your body or around in the context and they put information towards the web. Ambient intelligence, something which is moreover for a kind of passive user way, that's really like a, a technology that communicates in the background with each other uh, and is really monitored and operated by the web. Smart Home with Philips, it's just a research product, but uh, Philips is really investigating this whole scene. Uh, UB Media, which we call is actually kind of tagging all kinds of uh, products. This is actually a study project from uh, Scandinavia in which uh, you can like place several products which are all RFID tagged. You can place it in this bowl and you can interact with something on the web, but also you can use it for kids and they can uh, uh, actually operate and control a movie they're watching. So, very interesting. Identification, uh, I've placed here the Poke and Spark. Everybody knows it's like uh, really uh, online business cards, swapping information, identify each other. Navigation location, of course, uh, Everybody knows it, and also with, especially with the TomTom Tom traffic inf jam information, it's really dynamically downloaded to your, uh, to your device, and you can immediately avoid traffic jams. Monitoring and tracking, place the sensorware uh, unit. It's a new concept by uh, FedEx. You can actually place it inside your package, and uh, it senses uh, light, so it senses whether it's been opened or not. It also senses uh, temperature changes if you have uh, uh, an important object to transport. And of course, the last one, the best tech, which I already spoke about, toys and games, really big uh, field. So now I will just show the one, one important uh, case we've been doing. We really dove into this, and this is not really for commercial purposes. We only did it to get a little bit familiar with this whole field. We've done it together with students of the TU Delft, and uh, the challenge was to develop a portable device that expands the online activity of kids. Since kids are so active online on all these social websites, we thought, okay, well, maybe they can become active in the physical world again, but on the way they communicate uh, uh, on their social accounts. So what we come up together with the students was the social mutator, actually a social game uh, in which digital creatures mutate once they connect with each other. So let's see how this looks. This is the physical part. It's a proximity aware personal offline device, uh, a PA pod. Uh, this is just a non-working 3D printed uh, prototype. Um, we also had like a bigger prototype uh, with the chip on it. And uh, this was the platform that went along with it. So you could online track how your creature, how your personal creature had mutated uh, all the way. And you can also like customize and buy new parts if you're not satisfied with your creature. So I've, I've got a little movie. Uh, Tony, it takes 10 seconds just to give you a little example how the user testing went and how the product uh, worked. <laughs> Did it, 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 did it,
So that's it. And in the end, uh, this concept was, uh, was presented at the Intel Developers Forum. And uh, it was a real interesting quest. So what's all this for? I want to conclude with my final slide. Um, and I think us at Boiland, and, and maybe also you guys, if you want to dive into this, we want to really create meaningful on-off connections, because I think that um, in the se next several years, like every being, everything's going to get hooked up to the web, uh, but there'll be lots of trashy, shitty marketing gimmicks, and I think you should really think of it as, is a connection really the right solution? Is it really bringing something to people that enhances the quality of life, that brings something of an added value? Um, so think it through and, and see if your on-off connection uh, will be the best, best way to go. So um, I think, yeah, that's my, these are my contacts. So actually, on this moment, we're writing a book. So if you have any kind of input on concerning the Internet of Things of, or kind of examples, just let us know through Twitter or whatever. Um, and we'll see where we stand next year. That's it. Thank you. Anyone? Please not in the back. <laughs> nah. Someone else. Kind of. <laughs> we have a lot of time uh, today for questions. So prepare your Q&A. Uh, for the next spe speakers, we will have about 10 minutes Q&A. So prepare your questions. <clears throat> Hi, Mino. I, Hi. Love, I love your mustache. Um, Thanks. I, 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 must, I must honestly say that, um, first of all, I'm not really sure whether all this Internet of Things, you know, making new hardware devices, new peripherals, will really take this, this common field of social media much further. So I'm a bit skeptical about this. It seems like the next big, you know, thing to, to, to be excited about, but which is not really that exciting. Um, on the game, however, that you showed the movie of, uh, I, was, I was struck by, or uh, excited by the uh, idea of using these animated or cartoon-like figures. So could you tell something about how the interaction was with these figures? The and, and how, yeah, how um, did the children that you, um, you know, tested this app with, did they uh, mostly like, it, like the game experience because of the mobile technological side of it, or did, you, did they like it m more because of the animation and the and the storyline. Well, yeah, I, I think they especially liked it because of the way the cartoony figures were drawn. Um, in fact, when we started this project, we let them, we did several creative sessions with them, and they could draw their own parts. And actually, what you saw, all the, all the cartoony drawings, uh, were derived from their own sketches. Um, so, yeah, I, I think they especially liked that. And also, we really wanted to aim at uh, kids who were in between uh, secondary school and no, uh, between their primary year of secondary school and the last year of, uh, gr of uh, grammar school. Um, because we know, like, okay, you know it from yourself, you're, you're becoming uh, a new student of a new school and you're, maybe you're not feeling at ease. And with this kind of product, we really wanted to, okay, because on the social websites, they can say whatever they want and they really know their way around. And if you're at a new school, uh, and then everything's new, so we want to, to, to challenge them if we gave them these kind of uh, wrist uh, things. Like if they would step towards new, new friends um, because they want to, to, in order to mutate, um, something which they wouldn't have done if they hadn't these things. So that's, that's really our, our target group, and I hopefully, uh, I think that will answer your question. Yeah, you. <coughs> cool. We have another question from, actually, Twitter. Yes, where is Marcel Houtman? Houtman. Ed Hout? Where ben je? Kijk. Ed Hout? Do you remember your question? Uh, which one? <laughs> which one did you pick? Uh, the business model one. Ah, okay. <laughs> Hi, Menno. Hi. 
Um, my experience with um, uh, smart home and domotica manufacturers is that they're really uh, vertically oriented, uh, which means they're really closed up and, and stuff like that. So how can the picture become complete? What will be the business model and how will the, the web of things uh, will become everything? So um, basically you want to know what kind of interesting business models you can derive from this? Or is that the, not your question? Well, I think it can only work if it all works together. So uh, how can we make, how can we force it, uh, the world to do like that? Because you mentioned Philips and they're not really open. Yeah. Yeah, well, first of all, um, we, we shouldn't force uh, uh, companies to, to really get everything online because, like I said in my last slide, I, I only think we should create meaningful connections and we should always think about the user because uh, in several meetings I've spoken with several people about this and, and they all tend to think quite techy, like yeah this is possible and that's possible and stuff and I think you really the basic is the user, what, what is better for, for users um, and then in the end I think you should um, really advise large corporations on, on what consumers want nowadays. So they're in search of authenticity, uh, they're in search of, of meaningful things and stuff like that. And there's a, these are all broad terms that you really have to describe um, how people feel right now about the, all these things and terms like customization and personalization. I think large corporations really have to, have to get to know that, have to really get to know what the user in this case wants. But I think we, we as, small, as small agencies can, can advise them on that. And that's, that's the first part, so user-oriented thinking. And the second part, in case of business models, you can really look at, okay, what business models are there on the web? So you have, like, you have many, many, many free business models and many, many uh, online startups fail in this. Um, but what are successful business models? Maybe the freemium business model that you can use uh, a normal product, web product, for free. If you want added functionality, you have to pay for it. So it's the freemium model. And you can combine this, for example, with uh, the physical part just by selling that product. It's always about atoms versus bits. And people tend to think or start to think that bits are always free, especially the younger generations, especially kids. They have a free Facebook account, they have a free Twitter account, they can freely move around the web. And uh, uh, I think that's an important thing, that people tend to think that everything online will be free. And when physical products come into the field, you can start selling them because atoms are the way to, to really sell and get benef benefit of your business. So it's an interesting field in terms of business model. I would have uh, another question, but very briefly an answer because yeah. we have, uh, I think, 30 seconds left. You are running a design agency, a web mm -hmm. design agency. What do you think are, are the skills needed to actually thrive as a design agency in this new field? Yeah, I think... Uh, the way to do this is to really get to know what different fields are, are playing in this, in this scene because there's a part of product design, there's also a part web design, but more and more there's also a part service design because I think meta products, what I've just been telling you, it's not about the product. Actually, you're delivering a service by the means of this kind of product. So we have to keep this in mind. It's not about that we want to sell uh, a kind of sensor thing you wear on your chest. No, it's because we want to sell the service that people have insights in how healthy they are by means of the meta product. So it's really about service design. And that connected with web design and product design, I think those are the most three important uh, fields to really grasp and let them interact with each other. So. Thank you, Menno. Thank you. Thank you.